got those, those rules there. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name's Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. And thank you. It's really good to be here. Um, and thank you for the invite. Um, I asked Maria to come and be a speaker uh, at this meeting, and she readily agreed uh, to come. Uh, she, the first thing she asked me was, she, "What do you think? Uh, do you think I got enough time, Coyle, and stuff like that?" And I told her, "I said, hey, you know." Uh, in the preamble, it says, you know, uh, our, sto our stories disclose in a general way what we what we like, what it used to be like and what we're like now. And so I said, you do fine and you have a story to tell. You have something to share. I've heard her share before up in our uh, groups that we go to up in uh, Everett. And so uh, she's uh She's uh, excited to be here, and I'll let her tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> Thanks, right. Thanks, Maria. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Maria. Hi, Maria. And um, I have seven and a half months sobriety. Um, so I asked Quill. So what do I say? And he's like, you know, it's the before and the after. So I thought a little bit about that. And uh, so I, I, I seemed to not have a problem with alcohol or drugs in my younger years. It all sort of like started with postpartum depression, actually. So I can kind of get back to that. But what happened was... Um, my father moved all of us to California because he was an artist and he worked for Hanna-Barbera. Um, and he, um, there were, there were four of us, four girls and my mom. So we moved to Hollywood and, uh, we, we lived in the suburb outside of Hollywood, but he worked in Hollywood. And so that lifestyle there was really interesting and new. Um, that was like late, late sixties, early seventies. And my father was very much enamored with the lifestyle. So he quickly became not excited about having a family and then moving on to becoming more like a swinger and a, and a partier and a drinker. And it was, he sort of like left us. So after, after those times, I don't really remember them that much, but my sisters remember them. And I always absorbed their pain their pain was very distinct. That divorce was not good. So that's sort of what started this feeling of like emptiness and loneliness that, that carried on through, through my years. Um, so my, my grandmother loved us very much. And so frankly, she was happy that my father was gone. So she moved up, she must move just to Northern California which is in the midst of that green triangle, which is where they grew marijuana illegally for a long time. And um, it was a big, um, it, it was definitely counterculture. Mm -hmm. And counterculture um, was interesting and it formed me and it, it was good and it was bad. So the, we moved into a town where we were hippies. So we were labeled hippies. And we, we drove in on a purple bus with all our belongings. And um, we moved into this house that my grandmother had purchased for us. And so we lived on a farm and we had an organic farm and had horses and pigs and cows and chickens and all that kind of thing. But the, it didn't matter what kind of farming experience we had or anything like that. We were all just very sad. We were very sad kids. We missed our dad um, and we felt forgotten. My mom had mental illness and it progressively got worse. So my older sister sort of took over that mothering role. And the, the further away it got from the divorce into the, the years as it went by, I was just a very lonely kid. And all I can say is that I just felt like I, there was something missing even though I had a, 
a good life in some ways. You know, growing up on a farm isn't terrible. Um, but as I got older, the the whole culture of um, growing marijuana illegally and selling it um, to make a profit and so you could live on it was all very tenuous. And so, you know, you couldn't tell your story because it was it was illegal. So you had to keep your parents safe by not telling your secrets. And so it kind of like created this whole very secret lifestyle, very private. And it was hard for me because I was very social and I wanted people to know me. Um, so as time went on, um, I got to high school and that kind of thing. And I, 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 didn't start to drink, I didn't start to drink early, but I always felt a lot of sadness and a lot of loneliness. And it, it, it was kind of toxic. I don't really know how to explain how that was, but I remember doing things to get attention that were sort of a little obnoxious. And so I was labeled a little bit obnoxious. Um, and so I, I ended up moving back here with my grandma as my family started to sort of fall apart. And I lived with my grand, grandmother for a long time. And she had alcohol. My mother didn't drink, but my grandmother did. And she had like, you know, the whole bar, you know, the old style, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, you had the little stirrers and all the little fancy cups and it was all dedicated to that, you know, with a mirror and everything. <laughs> and so I started to like, I was bored and so I would try those things and um, and then I started and I kind of felt good when I did it um, and so I was doing it a little more so I started to put the water into the you know t into the vodka and stuff so that she wouldn't notice that I had so much or whatever and she never really found out it wasn't like a, a big thing for her but I do remember like the way that alcohol made me feel when I drank it was like this sort of like, and, and I, and I kind of like that. As time went on, um, I had, um, you know, a couple of relationships that didn't work out or whatever, but then I finally got married when I was, when I was much later in life. And I had a, my first child at 31 and I had planned those children and I had two children and it was working out okay, although we were really broke, and that does cause a lot of issues. Um, but as the children started to grow, I got pregnant again, and that's when it really all, all fell apart. And um, I really am so grateful for my son now. But it was such a hard start, and I and I and I never want to even tell him how I felt because it wasn't good. I would dream that I was going to toss him out the window and I had these terrible, terrible thoughts. And I was like, Oh my God, I just hit the clock back to zero again. And, you know, I just had all this regret about having this third child and it was a, a really terrible way to feel. And I got very depressed and sad and my marriage wasn't a happy one anymore. And, um, one day I just went to the store and I got a bottle of wine and I, I was 41 um, and my baby was maybe a year old. Uh, and so having children late and all that kind of stuff and not having a great marriage, I just um, started to drink. And then I was like, man, this like feels really good. And so I, I would go to the, I would start to go to the store every night and I'd buy wine and, um, I would drink by myself. Um, and then I would, I started seeking it because I was having these like more sort of partying thoughts in my mind. I kind of wanted to like go out and do things and, and drink at bars and things like that. And so I would um, find any excuse and I started to like go out to bars. I was 41 years old. I mean, I hadn't really partied or done much of anything until that point. And, uh, I ended up going to New Orleans one night or when one, one time and uh, for, for a conference. And um, I remember going to the bar and having a good time and everything was fine. Then I 
I, I got so drunk that I, I couldn't walk to my room. And one of the people, one of the staff had to like help me. And um, I didn't know my room number or anything. I, it was just very odd that I was that drunk. Um, but I kind of liked it. Like I liked not being able to remember some of the painful things that I was dealing with. Um, and I liked that I was kid free for that weekend. And, and I felt really like free. And I, and, and so I was very attracted to all of that, even though I know it was like major shenanigans and it probably was even somewhat of an infidelity to my husband um, because it, I wasn't doing the right thing. Even though I was having an affair, I was, I was dealing in, in lies. So I, I, I got back from, from New Orleans and I was, I was just different. And I, and I told my husband I wanted a divorce and, um, and that's when I really started to drink. Um, he lived downstairs, I lived up and, and, and every night I would drink. And even if I got home from late from work, I'd still drink and I'd be up till two or three in the morning. And sometimes I was so drunk that I couldn't even walk from the couch to my bed, you know, and I'd watch movie after movie. And it was just like this huge escape and um, so I, I did. I did figure out that it was making me not do well in my life, and so I kind of pared it down, uh, and I slowed down, and, and I and I quit drinking wine because it seemed like it wasn't affecting me. So I didn't. I, I remember I stopped drinking for a couple months, but then I had just an, an emotional event, and I started drinking again, and I really just I just felt like I couldn't stop. Um, and I drank alone a lot. As time went on, my kids were growing. You know, I was trying to make ends meet or whatever. I had a lot of responsibilities with certain things. And I, I sold my house and I moved to another place with, um, with just my, my son. And um, I immediately sought out all the bars and all the places in my neighborhood. And uh, the, I, I actually found community in the bars right away. Um, but it wasn't something that I should be doing because I had a lot of responsibility and I need to be doing other things. So it was sort of like keeping me from being my best and my most successful self. So um, I had an opportunity um, to, to get a dog actually. And so I, I got this dog and I've always wanted a dog and I hadn't had a dog for a long time. So I would, I started to walk her and I would walk past this like old church building and I didn't know what it was. And it was kind of curious. There was a lot of people inside um, and it happened to be in a place. So I, I just walked past one day. I said, what is this place? Um, it doesn't have a cross or anything. I don't know what this is. And she said, oh, it's an AA place. So I walked past that for another year until I got brave enough to go in. So what happened was I, um, I had a new job and um, I was a supervisor. So after about two or three weeks, I said, hey, you know, this, you, know you, you guys have been doing so good. I really appreciate you. I'd like to take you out to, uh, to a certain pub and, um, and, and buy you hamburgers and fries. And, and if you'd like a drink or something, I, would, I want a treat. So, um, so, so we did that and then I don't really know what happened after that, but I do know that somebody m mentioned that somebody might have put something in my drink. I don't really know. Maybe the alcohol was treating me differently because I wasn't eating very much or I was tired or whatever, but I sat back in my seat and I knew I was drunk and I was going to drive. You know, I wasn't, I, I didn't seem to care about that, but I knew that I didn't feel good, so I leaned back. And then at some point, I don't remember anything else, but I did end up going home. That means I drove without knowing it. And I woke up the next day. I had let myself in. I walked to my bed, and I don't remember any of this, these things. That has never happened to me before. And that day, I was very, um, I was very hard on myself, and, and I, I, I avoided the thought of it. Um, but I knew that I really needed to go. So I went to the latest possible meeting because I spent all day hemming and hawing and feeling crappy and depressed about it. And then I finally went, I walked in and um, they were very welcoming. And 
I think what um, what I've gotten out of this, especially because it's not been very long, but I really have hammered this is I can't control things that are not outside myself. And I was so sad and depressed after I didn't drink that I would just cry and cry and cry. So I wanted to eat sugar and cry. And I, I dreamt about frosting, like stirring frosting, licking the spoon. I mean, it was like crazy. And it was like pornographic sugar. <laughs> it was like, um, so uh, that, that was a very um, challenging time. And that took about maybe three months of that, a lot of crying, a lot of wishing that I could have a drink. And then every day knowing that it was making me feel like this made me understand that I truly had a problem. Like the longer I was away from alcohol and the harder things got, it means that I was like growing and changing and it hurt like hell. And um, so, but the thing was, is that my daughter had mentioned to me several times, mom, I think you have a drinking problem. And I would get mad and say like, whatever, you know, and, but she, she was amazing because I'd never seen this side of her because I never gave her an opportunity. And what it was, was that she wanted to tell me that mom, you're trying, you're doing good things. And I, that was like really made me feel proud that I was doing that and that she could see it. Um, and then also I was just a better parent in general, pretty much pretty quickly because I wasn't being distracted by alcohol. And I was a, I'll do it later, mom. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'm too exhausted. I want to do it. I don't want to do it now. And so my kids were not getting what they needed. So that really made a difference in the way I'm parenting. I have a much better relationship with my kids pretty much right off the bat. Um, when they heard that I quit drinking, they couldn't believe it. Um, and then my son is like, I thought you said you didn't have a problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so it's been really good. And then also, um, the other thing about my changes is that I really had to let people go. I had a lot of people in my life that were not good for me. And that was one of the things that I really needed to look at. So there was a lot of blocking and a lot of saying goodbye and a lot of like not looking back. The best thing about AA is that I found a pretty instant community, people that I really connect with finding similar people like Coyle that have some like-mindedness, you can have a discussion and it's fascinating. Um, and that's really what feeds me. It helps me not drink to be able to be stimulated and to talk to people that have similar views and that you can really share and they really listen. Being heard is so healing. So um, I just, I just been going to meetings a lot. It's not without drama. Every meeting, every meeting place, every meeting hall, they're really good. And sometimes they're not so great. Um, but it's like a mirror of regular society without alcohol. Um, and I'm finding that like all of my, all of the things that I do every day are just, it's just easier because I'm not recovering from drinking the night before, which is pretty much every day. So I, you know, I'm back to climbing mountains and I'm back to, you know, getting finished at work, not just doing, you know, 90%, I'm doing the 100% or the 110%, you know. Um, and people are just in general are seeing my changes. A lot of people wonder, like, what, 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 what did you do? And I just said, I'm sober. And they're like, oh. And I'm like, and I'm really proud of being sober. It's good. It's a good thing. So thank you so much for um, listening today. And I was nervous, <laughs> um, but I, uh, I just want you to know that I value your listening ears. It helps me heal. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you.